In this video, we're going to focus on what happens when we are not at standard state conditions. So in the last video, we thought about cell potential and how that can be useful in determining the equilibrium constant of a sparingly soluble salt. We thought about how we can determine those cell potentials by adding the standard cell potentials, half cell potentials in the electrochemical series. And in this video, we want to focus on what happens when we are in more real life kind of conditions, non-standard state conditions. How do we find that potential and what are some useful things we can do with it? For review, let's think about how those thermodynamic quantities that we studied in the last unit are connected to that cell potential. Remember that our standard free energy is connected to the standard cell potential via this equation, where n is the number of electrons being transferred and f is that Faraday's constant. And the standard free energy change is also connected to the equilibrium constant k, where r is a gas law constant and t is the temperature in Kelvin. When we set those two equal to each other, we get a direct link from our equilibrium constant k that's connected to how much product and reactant are present when the reaction is complete at equilibrium and our standard cell potential. We also talked a little bit about this equation that delta G is equal to the standard free energy change plus RT times the natural log of Q where Q is the quotient or the relative concentrations of reactant and product at non-equilibrium conditions. So we're going to focus on that equation a little bit more here. So if we're not at standard state conditions, let's think about what's happening in our reaction. So during a reaction, free energy is changing as the reaction proceeds towards equilibrium. So in a working voltaic cell, the reaction, reactants are decreasing and the products are increasing. And that's true in any reaction as it proceeds the reaction the reactants are decreasing and the products are increasing over time. We talked a lot more about that in kinetics, which we'll review again at the end of the semester. So we want to think about how free energy is changing during that process. And that standard free energy, that little circle, does not change. Remember that when we're calculating the standard free energy change, we're just looking at the difference between the free energy of forming pure products and the free energy of forming pure reactants. So we're just looking at that difference. That's what the standard free energy tells us is what is the difference in energy between pure products and pure reactants. Delta G not standard is telling us what is the difference in energy as the reaction is actually happening, as it's proceeding with all the different amounts and possibilities of amount of reactant and amount of product. As it proceeds, it works towards equilibrium, right? So at equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero. And if delta G is equal to zero, then our cell potential is equal to zero, and we can no longer get work from our cell, our reaction is done. It's kind of what we call a dead battery, right? We have to charge the battery up, which is really reversing the reaction, to repopulate the amount of reactant and take away the amount of product so that the reaction can happen in the spontaneous direction all over again. So quantitatively, this idea of changing free energy is that equation on the previous slide, right? Where we had free energy is equal to the standard free energy change plus the quantity RT, where R is the gas law constant, T is the temperature in Kelvin, natural log of Q, that quotient, which looks an awful lot like the expression for K. It's the activities of products over reactants raised to their stoichiometric coefficients, but those concentrations or partial pressures are not at equilibrium. We also have that the standard free energy change is connected to the standard cell potential and the free energy change is also connected to cell potential, not standard. And so if we measure the cell potential at not standard conditions, we're going to connect that to not standard free energy changes. 
putting those things together, right, putting these equations in for delta G and delta G naught, we get what's called the Nernst equation. So this is a really useful equation that connects the cell potential that we could measure to the quantities that are present in solution at some point through the reaction. So there's a lot of constants here. So at room temperature, we can simplify this equation just a little bit, right? So at 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, R is a constant, F is a constant. The only thing that's changing here is the number of electrons in our system that are being transferred, the number of moles of electrons being transferred. And if we look carefully at this equation, it looks a little bit like a line, right? So our cell potential changes with the quantities, the amount of product and reactant present at any time during a reaction. The standard cell potential should be constant and the number of moles changing for a particular reaction are going to be the same. So we could make a plot. Oops. And let me just switch it red. If we plot the potential that we measure as a function of the natural log of the quotient, we should get a line, a negative slope, where the slope of that line depends on the number of electrons being transferred and the y-intercept should be equal to the standard cell potential. So we could do this experimentally, right? We could measure different cell potentials at different concentrations and make a plot. And from that plot, we could experimentally determine the standard cell potential and the number of electrons being transferred in a particular reaction. So guess what we're going to do in our virtual lab this week? We are going to virtually measure a bunch of potentials at different concentrations and make this plot and analyze that data of the plot. It might also be really helpful at this point to either pause the video or after you're done, go back and review the animation in the textbook of cell potential equilibrium and free energy that kind of goes through this with working cells, animated, what's happening. It's a helpful animation for you to view. So that's just a preview of what's coming next with the lab. But right now I want to come back to this Nernst equation and think about the importance of this and how this works. So this is a way where we can connect potentials for real things. Think neurons firing. Right, so non-standard state conditions, real life, um, in biology, estimating those potential differences across cell membranes, or measuring all kinds of potential differences in biological and non-biological systems. So it's a really useful equation for us. So in our first example, what I want to talk about is how we could use this Nernst equation to find the potential of the cell, right? Calculate the potential of this cell. And we've got this at non-standard state conditions, right? These concentrations are not one molar. So in order for us to do that, let's just go back one slide, right? So we need the standard cell potential, and we're need, gonna need to know how many electrons are being transferred. So we worked on how to do standard cell potentials in the last video, so let's just go through that here. So it's always anode to cathode, oxidation at the anode, so our zinc is being oxidized. So I took that reduction potential of zinc of negative 0.76 and flipped it on its head so that we've got zinc being oxidized and we've got iron plus two ions being reduced. So overall, when we add up this reaction and it's cell potential, standard potentials, we get the overall standard cell potential. When we add these up, we get positive 0.32 volts and our overall reaction, right? So we've got zinc metal and iron ions going to zinc ions and iron metal. So from this balanced overall reaction and standard cell potential, the first thing I want to do is find the value for the quotient, Q. So our non-standard state conditions 
So we always for Q activities of products over reactants. So here our products are zinc and iron. Remember that solids, the activity is one, so they don't appear in the expression. So we just have the concentration of zinc ions over the concentration of iron, two plus ions. Again, the zinc solid does not appear in the expression for Q. So now we can put in our values of 1.5 molar for zinc concentration, 0.1 molar for our iron concentration. We get a Q value of 15. So we're going to assume, since it's not given in the problem, that this is at 25 degrees. That's been our assumption this whole unit, and that works out well. So our cell potential for this particular example, these concentrations, is going to be the standard cell potential minus 0.02569. 93 volts divided by the number of electrons being transferred times the natural log of Q. So in this case, our standard cell potential we determined here is 0 0.32 volts. Our Q is 15. When we evaluate this, we get a cell potential of plus 0.29 volts. So this could be useful if we were trying to think of different concentrations and if we want to get more energy or less energy out of a particular cell, using the Nernst equation can be really helpful. Another thing that the Nernst equation is often used for is calculating concentrations. And to calculate concentrations, we use what's called a concentration cell. And it's a really important application of this. So you can imagine we could set up a cell, and if we look at this, well, it's copper, 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 copper everywhere, right? So we've got copper ions being um, formed in the oxidation at the anode and copper metal being formed at the cathode by the reduction of copper ions. But we see we have non-standard state conditions, right? So these are different concentrations. So what's going to happen, it's still going to be spontaneous because this concentration is lower than this concentration and the electrons will flow until the concentrations are the same. So we're showing here that we're depleting the anode material and it's piling up here on the cathode. So the overall half reaction is the same on both sides, right? So we've got copper being oxidized at the anode, copper being reduced at the cathode. So the reduction potential for copper is plus 3,4 volts, but the oxidation is minus 3,4 volts. So when we add those up, we're going to get a zero cell potential for our standard cell potential. Overall, we're going to have copper ions on the from the reduction side, the left-hand side, going to copper ions on the right-hand side or the anode side or oxidation side. So how can we use this Nernst equation? Well, so we can simplify, first of all, our basic equation at 25 degrees because our standard cell potential will always be zero, right? Because the same thing's being oxidized as is being reduced. And in this case, right, I'm just going to make this bigger, right? We've got copper ions at one molar going to copper ions at 0.1 molar is our overall reaction. So the value for Q is 0.1 over 1, substituting in for the two electrons oops, being transferred. We get a cell potential of 0 0.0296 volts, exactly what's measured here on our little voltmeter. So this is just to illustrate how we can use that Nernst equation with a concentration cell. How it's often used is in the next example, and that is to find the concentration of an unknown substance. Okay, so how do we use the Nernst equation to find concentration? And this is a very useful application. So in this question, we have a slightly different system. So now we have each electrode compartment of, again, galvanic cell contains a silver electrode and 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar silver nitrate. So remember that silver nitrate is soluble, so that means I'm going to have 0.1 molar silver ions and 0.1 molar nitrate ions, right, because that is going to break apart in its two ionic components. And those two are connected by a salt bridge. So this looks like a concentration cell similar to the one on the previous side, only with silver and silver ions. 
Now what we do is add 10 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium chloride to the left-hand compartment. So what that's going to do is change the concentration of silver because now I've got sodium ions and chloride ions, the same number of sodium ions and chloride ions that I had of silver and nitrate ions. Almost all of the silver precipitates as silver chloride, right? So silver chloride is not soluble, oops, but silver nitrate is soluble. So remember from the previous slide though that our not soluble things turn out to be slightly soluble. A small amount remains in solution as in this saturated solution of silver chloride. And we want to figure out how much silver is in that saturated solution. So we can set up this situation and measure the cell potential of this non-standard cell and figure out what's going on with the concentrations. So overall, we could write the overall reaction. So silver is going to be oxidized on the anode and reduced on the cathode. So our concentration on the right has not changed, right? We left that part alone. So there's 0.1 molar concentration on the right. And in the left, we precipitated most of that silver. So we know it's much lower than 0.1, but we want to figure out what that concentration is. So again, we can find the quotient, products over reactants. So I'm just putting the left and right there to make it a little more obvious because we're always going to have what's on the left will be our product, what's on the right will be our reactant ion in a um, concentration cell situation. So we know the concentration on the right is 0.1, but we don't know what the concentration on the left is. We do know from the Nernst equation that the cell potential is going to be equal to zero, right? Because the silver is being reduced and oxidized, minus 0.025693 volts over how many electrons? Since it's silver plus one going to silver metal, it'll be one electron times the natural log of Q. So the natural log of Q is just the cell negative of the cell potential divided by our 0.025693 volts. So our measured cell potential is put in there. So we find that the natural log of Q is then equal to negative 16.34. So we exponentiate both sides, right? So our Q is equal to the exponential of negative 16.34. We solve for X, which is our silver concentration on the left. And we find that the silver concentration is eight times 10 to the negative ninth molar. So this is a way we can figure out how soluble insoluble things actually are. It's also a way we can measure small amounts of ions in solution. So the Nernst equation can be used for selective electrodes. So if we are interested in, say, finding how much lead is in water, we could build an electrode that measures lead. If we're interested in finding the pH of a solution, we want to know what's the H plus concentration in solution. So we can make an electrode, for example, a calomel electrode to determine the pH of a solution. So this is something you've already used before is a pH meter. And a pH meter is really a electrode that is measuring concentration. So it's an ion selective electrode and what it's really measuring in solution is a potential difference between what's inside the electrode and what's inside your solution. It Then you can relate quite easily mathematically the H plus concentration or the pH to that potential. So here's from our Nernst equation in general, our E cell, so our measured potential is this standard cell, plus we've changed this from the 0.029 to 0.05 so that we could get a log function, log base LOG base 10 instead of a natural log function so that we could easily find the pH, which is the LOG of the H plus concentration. So this is just one example of an ion, electrode, an ion selective electrode that is very useful. If we were doing the lab in person, we would be using that electrode to measure the potential and then that would be our standard potential or our standard electrode against other solutions. But we're gonna do this fun online virtual lab instead.
So for practice, using this Nernst equation, developed another activity, activity 24. So make sure you practice doing that so that these concepts are some more solidified in your head. So the activity 24 will be a blank activity on Sakai, and it will also be on Sakai under the exams and activities. So you can look at the blank activity, complete it, and then just enter your answers in on Sakai. All right, hope you're having a good day.